you said that the original sin has never been dealt with. What do you think should be done? I mean, I think we have to have honest conversations about it. And I think that was one of the benefits of the 45th president of the United States, that for the first time in this country, uh, it was it was front and center. And um, we were we were dealing we were, we were having conversations outwardly about race. When I when I look at uh, Charlottesville, for example, you know, with the tiki torches and the uh, Jews shall not replace us and the um, uh, chant races and anti-Semitic chants that were had in, in Charlottesville. What stuck out to me the most was that nobody wore a hood. Nobody covered their face. They didn't wear masks. They were so emboldened and comfortable in their anti-Semitism, in their racism. And for me, that was a watershed moment in this country where people, it was no longer in the dark corners. And we were, we were outwardly having these conversations about the fact that systemic racism is a true issue. Um, I think that many of these systems we have to deconstruct. Um, and I say reimagine earlier, I'll throw that word out there again, but rebuild them in an image that's inclusive. I don't. I mean, I, I've, I've never, and I don't, I don't really know anybody. I don't, I don't want you to dance for me. I just want to be on the dance floor. I mean, I just hope that, it pe- that everyone has an opportunity. How do you go about that? How do you do that? You know, you sound kind of pessimistic that you think, eh, it ain't going to happen. It's too far gone. Are you of the belief that it's not going to happen, that we've passed that level? No, I mean, I still, I mean, I still have faith. I have faith in tomorrow. Um, I always do. I'll keep that. My father believed, my, you know, my father was shot in the civil rights movement. He was shot in the shoulder. My father went to prison not once, but twice. Once for refusing to go to Vietnam and once for the incidents of the Orange Road Massacre. The police shot him and they put him in prison. Um, my sister's middle name is Abadame. It's Swahili. It means born while father's away because my sister was born while my father was in, the, in, the, in, in prison. <clears throat> and my, my dad, and the reason I say there's nothing irredeemable about this country is my dad could have lashed out with righteous anger, but instead, like, I mean, he believed like Abraham Lincoln believed in the better angels of our nature. I think to answer your question specifically, though, it, there, there's, there's no such thing as rising tide lifts all boats. Um, I think there has to be, um, um, you know, specific policy proposals that deal with issues of race in this country and address specific uh, specific problems. Um, you know, people say rising tide lifts all boats. Well, what if you have a dinghy? Um, what if you ain't got no boat at all? What if you got a surfboard with a hole in it? Like, um, you know, everybody doesn't have the opportunity to rise with the, with the tide. And so, um, I'm just a firm believer that we just have to make sure that we create that equity and create that opportunity. Give me an example of what you would implement as a core policy that would start creating what you're looking for? You know, I, I, first of all, let's start with, uh, let's start with public education. Um, you know, we can go from public education to, you know, affordable housing to um, water. You know, there are a hundred cities in these United States that have less potable water than Flint, Michigan. Um, we can go to a criminal justice system that we're, that are in tatters, but in this country, Dr. Phil, you are punished because of the zip code that you're born into. Um, that's just a fact. Um, and ed schools are funded on a three-legged system. Uh, you have federal funding, you have state funding, you have local funding. It's a three-legged stool. And so, you know, if you're in a poor community, um, oftentimes dating back to Brown versus the Board of Education, where Chief Justice Warren said that segregation causes a sense of inferiority by placing children in environments not conducive to learning, uh, these communities are many times black and brown communities. And instead of creating new systems of, of, of streams of revenue to pump into these areas, um, whether or not it's gaming, whether or not it's marijuana, um, being creative or inventive, whether or not it's creating a tax base to woo the next, you know, Revlon or Tesla to your community, um, many times these areas remain stagnant. And, you know, I, I don't know if you read Friedman, Dr. Phil, but not a big Friedman fan, but, he, you know, he wrote The World is Flat. I agree. The, I'm not like Kyrie Irving crazy, like you're not going to fall off the edge. But yet the world is flat because we're commit, We are now competing with kids. If you graduate in South Carolina, you're now competing with kids who graduate around the world. And we are not preparing our particularly black children for a 21st century global economy. And so, yes, 
I would have a policy proposal that directly infuses cash into these areas through innovation, progressive ideals, um, so that these kids have the resources to learn and compete. What do you think about these situations now where there are neighborhoods that are high crime, low tax base, low industry opportunities? How do we get those kids out of there to get the kind of opportunities that they need to have a chance, to have a shot, to not get up the ladder, but even get on the ladder? To, to even have a ladder, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the question is, I mean, we have to address the underlying systemic reasons that we have these communities in the first place, the perif- proliferation of guns. People talk about Chicago often. And I always say that, you know, the reason there's so many guns in Chicago is because Indiana has terrible gun laws. That's where the guns come from. They come from an hour away, 45 minutes away in Indiana. But also we have to invest in these communities. You have to have summer lunch programs, summer job programs. You have to have after school programs. You have to have resources. Um, in many of these communities, um, many, many of these communities, black fathers are not in the homes um, due to mass incarceration. You have, you know, for a very long period of time, Dr. Dr. Phelan, you are, you know this better than I, so I dare not step into your uh, bailiwick, but, um, you know, crack in this country was seen to be a crime. It was a, it was, they, they treated it as a crime. Um, And opioid addiction is treated as a public health outcry. And so I think that You know, we have to examine the way uh, that we adjudicate these crimes, that we treat these crimes. Um, We have to examine the resources and outlets. One of the things I did in my district was I built a library. People laugh at me. They're like, that was the best thing you did? I was like, yeah, because right now in Denmark, kids can go there and they can have after school programs. They can have summer programs. People go there to get access to Wi-Fi. Um, You know, it's 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 a very, very real thing. And just. Uh, being just being innovative and thinking about what your community needs and trying to meet those goals is is what we need more of. People want to run the TV. They want to be a part of a clique or whatever and say the most outrageous things. And nobody wants to work and get it done anymore. There's interestingly a lot of research about violence, gun violence in particular. As I'm sure you know, it clusters. There are even micro clusters. It clusters into neighborhoods. And even within a neighborhood, it clusters into specific blocks within a neighborhood. Empirical evidence has shown that if you focus on that micro cluster in a neighborhood and you go into those that are committing that violence, you actually sit down with those wrongdoers and say, okay, look, we know who's doing this, we know it's you. We may not have enough to arrest you right now, but we know that it's you, and we want to offer you an alternative. We want to provide you with a ladder and with a way to change this and alter this to give you a way to get out of this situation that the results are pretty astounding in terms of the number of these violent individuals that choose a different path. They choose to seize that opportunity, choose that education, choose whether it's occupational education or school or whatever, that they actually embrace that and get themselves out of that situation if somebody's willing to do that with them and for them. It's just a matter of focusing on those micro clusters to really change the face of that community. And you're, you're, I mean, you're preaching to the choir. I, I wholeheartedly agree, but it takes that focus. It takes the resources. It takes the opportunity. Just giving people an opportunity, you'll be surprised. Right? Having a certain level of expectation for them, you'll be surprised. We get caught up in stigmas. You know, Dr. Phil, one of the things I always tell folk, and it flusters them a little bit, I was like, you know, there's no such thing as black on black crime. You know, that's like not a real thing. It's a it's, it's a sociological myth. To your point, we live in highly segregated communities. And because we live in these highly segregated communities, people are more prone and apt to commit crimes against people that they're in those clusters with. And so 90 percent of all people who black folk who are killed are killed by black folk. But 90 percent of all white people who are killed are killed by white folk. And it's because of these clusters, it's because of these highly segregated communities that we live in. 
And my only point in saying that is that if we focus on the things that are real and not these highly divisive rhetorical analysis going all the way back to the beginning of our conversation that we throw out there on cable news news and deal with the substance as you just said we'd have much stronger healthier and better communities